Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Welcome to the Theater Podcast, intimate personal conversations with theater's biggest names. I'm your host, Alan Seals, and my guest today is Will Hockman, who is making his Broadway debut in the psychological thriller, The Sound Inside, written by Adam Rapp, who is a Pulitzer Prize finalist. This show is incredible. It just throws you into some of the depths of the human the human psyche. It's a two-person show. It's Will and Mary Louise Parker on stage the entire time. This guy is incredible. He didn't do anything until he, in the theater, he didn't do anything until he was 20 in college. And he's now making his Broadway debut at 27. So you do the math. He just all of a sudden took to, took to acting, wanted to explore it, was listening to the own, his own voice inside of his head. And Got also got an economics degree, so uh, of course you know he's got that. But just fell into this love of theater and is is really using it as a way to uh, to to find himself and express himself. So to get a better knowledge of the industry, he's also started out doing like production work. So he was a second AD, which helped him understand the directing side of things. He's been a writer, he's been a producer, and he's actually writing his own his own scripts now, which is incredible. And just a really intellectual guy seems like an old soul. You know, he's a 27 year old that just cannot get enough learning. Doesn't like to go out like normal 27 year olds do just wants to become a more globally responsible, aware, knowledgeable person. And I can highly, highly respect that. So before we get into this interview, please, as always, visit me on thetheaterpodcast.com. Show your support for the podcast via thetheaterpodcast.com slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And as always, please find me on Instagram and Twitter, theater underscore podcast. Reach out, say hi. I love to say hi to everybody. Now, everyone, please enjoy this episode with Will Hockman. This Brooklyn-born actor is currently making his Broadway debut in the play The Sound Inside, written by Pulitzer Prize finalist Adam Rapp, directed by Tony winner David Cromer, starring alongside Tony winner Mary Louise Parker. Obviously, this guy has talent pouring out of every pore of his body, Will Hockman. Welcome to the Theater Podcast. Hey, thanks so much, man. You are in good company. With you, yes, having a nice time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in the in the show, the sound inside, like just getting great reviews. Oh, thanks. And in the show, it's pushing boundaries. It's, but I guess for those who don't know, uh, I read different reviews that give different levels of synopsis and mm-hmm. whatnot. So, like, how do you want? What do you want to tell people about it without giving too much away? Yeah, let's 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 not give too much away. Well. People are saying it's a psychological thriller, which I suppose is true. Uh, do, do you think it's a psychological thriller? I think I think so because it, like, you break the fourth wall. You're talking to the quite audience. a lot. Oh yeah, oh, and yeah. you're basically saying, you know, giving. Well, the way it's written, your two characters, you and Mary Louise Parker, are you're talking to the audience about your characters in in a way that most people are never able to talk about. In their in their real lives, like the innermost thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it'd be as uh, while we're talking right now. You know, if if I were to just say, and then I looked across at you, and you scratched your thumb, and I thought, and then said something profound about the way that you scratched your thumb. And if I wanted to do that, I'd have to go be Adam Rapp and <laughs> write for thirty years and be a brilliant playwright. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it, the the show is about a. Uh, Yale University creative writing professor who is alone in the world and gets diagnosed with a serious illness. And as the horrors of that unfold, she develops this profound relationship with a mysterious, precocious, brilliant, also lonely freshman writer in her class. So your character is 18? Yeah, 18, 19. He's a freshman. Right, okay. And the character doesn't quite connect with with his peers. 
Yes, doesn't and has a, a tough time connecting with anyone, frankly. Right. Uh, he is he lives a lot in his head and in the world of literature and the world of writing, and is far from home, and doesn't really have a lot of friends. And so, you know, imagine if all you did all day was read and write and talk to basically no one. There are some people I know that are sort of like that. Sure, yeah. Well, okay, so that's that's a good segue in my mind. He thinks to himself, now is a good time to talk about Will's childhood. Will grew up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so how much, how much of little Will got brought into this character? Oh, man. Wow. So, so are you saying how much, you know, was, was 18-year-old Will like 18-year-old Not even 18. Even young, I mean, like, go back to the beginning. You grew up in Brooklyn. I grew up in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, what part of Brooklyn? Carroll Gardens, Cobble Hill. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm in uh, Borum Hill now. Oh, happy days. Yeah. I, I want to, like, know where you live now, but it's a <laughs> podcast, so we'll talk about that later. Okay. Oh, right on. Well, so you know the neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Welcome. How long have you been there? Uh, two years. Two and a half years. Okay. Two, two just over two years now, yeah. Oh, great. Well, when we're not recording, I'll ask you about where you are, and we can talk about <laughs> local shops. Okay. Uh, that neighborhood has a really special place for me. and You know, that's where I spent my entire childhood. I, I didn't even go into Manhattan that much. I'm, I'm really like, I'm a Brooklyn boy. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I grew up playing sports. I played baseball. I played basketball. Very outgoing, full of energy, full of life, running around a lot, a lot of friends. I had a a childhood that I look back on really fondly and remember well. And big kudos to my parents, Ken and Marlene, whom I love <laughs> very much. I think they're extraordinary parents. Um, and I, I credit a lot of where I am now with the seeds that they instilled in me and sort of tilled the soil that allowed to grow. Mm -hmm. And I have a twin sister and an older brother. And so I had a, a big loving family that I grew up in. If she feels pain... If she gets cut, do you feel pain? You know, we were, let's say, seven or eight. And my sister and my mom and I were going for a walk. And I was all excited. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to like jump on stuff and run on stuff. And my sister said, hold on. I need to go get something. And she runs off into the house somewhere and gets a little fanny pack and comes back with a little fanny pack. And we go for a walk. And we walk a couple blocks. We walk a couple more blocks. And I'm I'm like, energetic little kid and I jump up on a curb and I lose my balance, which I never did as a kid and still rarely do. I try to be a balanced mm -hmm. guy and cut my knee and my knee starts bleeding and my sister doesn't blink. She opens her fanny pack and takes out a Band-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> she knew. She knew. She knew. Oh, that's creepy cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So, Good childhood, one of three, yes. I guess, in growing yes. up in Brooklyn. Technically the youngest of three. I mean, yes. we're twins, but she's two minutes older. Two minutes older, yeah. Yes. Okay, so in Brooklyn, um, sports, 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 sports. Where did the performing, where, where did theater come in? Hard to know exactly. It's a thing that I've always wanted to do and felt really drawn to. I, I would watch movies with my family and there'd be a little voice, you know, listen to the sound inside, listen to the sound inside is a repeated refrain that Mary Louise says during our show. Mm -hmm. And I had that little voice as a kid. I'd watch a movie and go, I, I want to do that. And I think I kind of can. I don't know why, but to a certain degree, I feel like that's the thing that I want to do. And never did at all. And I, I didn't do any plays in school. I never did any plays in high school. I would always want to do the talent shows and would find a different reason not to do it. Every now and then I'd get on stage and I'd play guitar and you know I'd, I'd play a song and sing with a buddy or something. But I never really let myself listen to the sound inside, mm -hmm. frankly. And um, yeah, so it, it took until really junior year of college to take an acting class. Wow. Yeah. The first time I ever acted properly, I was... Uh, 20. And how old are you now? 27. So seven, wow, seven years to Broadway from the very first time you did anything. Yeah. That's impressive. Oh, well, thank you. It, it astounds me as well. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's something else, man. 
And now we have this beautiful view in Midtown. It's it's crazy. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. Broadway Podcast Network Studio. Hey. 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 Ain't no joke. Um, I just fully expected. I've been watching Parks and Rec, and I just fully expected there to be. Have you seen that show? Of course. Yeah, I just fully expected there to be that noise on the radio show. You know, what's the name of the show? Something. In, oh, Nick Kroll's character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, crap. I can't remember. Anyway, I thought there was yeah. going to be like a... <laughs> right when you said <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad there wasn't. No, no. We, a little bit more serious on, on this podcast. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I'll stop making jokes. Uh, I apologize. Oh, please don't. If, please don't. This is, don't. this is you. This is it's all about... It's a serious podcast. Oh, no. We're, we're funny. We're smiling. <laughs> he said to himself nervously, hoping that the podcast is going well. <laughs> you have... An economics degree. I do. From college. I Where'd do. you go to college, by the way? Colby College up okay. in Maine. So economics. Yeah. I went into college thinking I was going to double major in international relations and Spanish. Secretly, I knew I was always going to be an actor. And so all of this was, was sort of doing what I felt pressure to do um, from some ambiguous third societal party, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to go to a good college and mm -hmm. I'm supposed to get a good degree. And uh, I, I really stepped into that line. And so I wound up studying economics, not so much from an in, innate interest in economics, more that I like math and I'm good at math to a degree. Mm -hmm. And it's what other people in school were studying. And so I sort of just like, stepped into line as this sheep. And I was like, bah, I'll study economics. Okay. And did, uh, knowing full well that it, it wasn't really the thing that I was crazy about. And it wasn't even necessarily the thing that I was that good at. I was just doing it because it, it was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, at, at a certain point, I had to, I had to change directions. And I, and I learned a lot studying economics. And I think it gave me certain frameworks of thinking about the world and thinking analytically and critically, and I, all of those things are great. Um, but frankly, I think a lot of the, the way that I sort of approach my career and look at navigating the world comes from my family and my parents, who are both hardworking and curious and brilliant and both entrepreneurs in their own right. And so a lot of that comes from, from them. I was going to ask if any of the pressure came from your parents. No, no, they, they're so supportive, really, in any endeavor. Um, I mean, I remember when I first told them I was taking an acting class and I really loved it. And uh, by the time that I decided, okay, I'm going to come back home to New York and pursue this whole hog, I'm, I'm going to give this a real shot here. They were really supportive, and I, I credit that, A, be, to them, because I think they're loving, beautiful people, and B, because... I think the way that I framed it was pretty reasonable. I didn't say, "Hey, I'm I'm throwing away everything I'm doing, and you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pursue this crazy thing." I, I framed it like, "Okay, I'm starting a small business here, sort of the way that I'm thinking about it. And wh what do you guys think about the way that I'm thinking about it? I want to do this right." And so it sort of turned into a a family think tank. Where, okay, how do we? Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Th that's... We, call it, we call it the Hockman think tank. We sort of <laughs> put our five heads together and we all have different points of view. It's really interesting. That's interesting. You said, you know, you, you think of it, you approach it like starting a small business because it's, it, that's literally what you're doing. Totally. And you're, you're selling yourself. Right. You have to sell yourself to casting directors, to press agents, to the, to executives. Like you're putting yourself out there in whatever way you can. And Which can feel really icky, you know, it, it, that runs so counter to the actual job, which is be an artist and open your soul and tell stories and meet amazing people. That th That's the beautiful part of the job. And then there's this whole other thing, which is, well, you know, how what street do you need to walk down to even get to do that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, I think that's part of why, as my opinion, is part of why a lot of people get really taken advantage of. Yeah. Because it's your job to be vulnerable yeah. and expose your, you know, the sound inside without trying to be funny. And people can manipulate that so easily. Sure. I, I'm, I feel very grateful that I have a loving family with good business sense and diverse points of view. So I, I would, you know, frankly... I, uh, my first agents, like my first de facto agents, right? Were like my family. I'd come home and I'd say, hey, 
brother, sister, mom, and dad, here, here's the things I'm facing. Mm-hmm. Here's how I'm thinking about it. What do you guys think about the way that I'm thinking about it? And so that really helps well, quite did, a lot. Did any of them have any performance experience? Like, were they approaching it from an acting side or from no, a business side? No, no, no. More just business, you know, level-headed, how to make it in the world. Um, my dad runs an advertising agency, mm. small business, which he runs himself. Mm-hmm. And my mother... Um, created the Doll and Toy Museum of New York many years ago. And just about the same time that I became an actor, she decided she was going to recreate the Doll and Toy Museum, excuse me, into the Toy Museum of New York. And she turned her museum into a traveling show. She had no acting experience either. She wrote a show called Queen Marlene's Toy Theater, starring herself, doing the history of toys. And she, and to this day now, travels around the city, performing the history of toys and now all kinds of other things many years later. Huh. And uh, so my mom and I became performers at the same time, interestingly, oh, which, which so like flipped fun. our family on its head a little <laughs> bit, which was really interesting. Yeah. No, I, think, I feel like there's something that Netflix is going to make a series out of one day. Great. You know, let's put that, out, right. let's put what, that out in the world. The history of toys. Great. Do you, do you watch um, The Toys That Made Us? No. It's a new Netflix series. But Mom, I'm sure you're going to listen to this. What's it called? The Toys That Made Us. The Toys That Made Us on Netflix. And we'll talk about it. Yeah, it's like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles whole hour about how that came to be Oh, made. so cool. Yeah, yeah. So uh, obviously whoever's writing all this stuff at Netflix, uh, we're, we're all children of the 80s because these are all toys. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, oh, these are so good. Yeah. I like to think about the pitches for things like this. Like I, I imagine the pitch for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles if you if you frame it on like a stand up, would be so funny. Guy walks into his boss's office. He's like, "Hey, listen, I got an idea." And the boss is like, "What's the idea?" He's like, "Teenagers are turtles with Renaissance painter names, and they love pizza." Boom. And they're teenagers. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, anyway, there that episode was good because it was a hard sell. If yeah. You, yeah. And not not hard to believe that. Okay. So you're you have. Film credits starting yeah. in 2015, um, as but not as an actor, as a writer, as a director, as a production manager, and even second AD. Yeah. So when you were acting, do you approach the business side of it first, or was that just kind of were you acting at the same time for like the uncredited work or the stuff that didn't go on IMDb or right. you know how did how did all that time of your life well the, shake out the way that I started thinking about it and the way that I think about it still is. I want to think critically about the world and I want to be a part of telling stories that are honest and ask hard questions and are funny and make you laugh and make you smile and make you think about the world. And I want to work with incredible people and I want to become a more fully formed human being and I want to have amazing experiences. And looking at that from a big picture, being an actor is not the only way to reach those things. And I didn't go to acting school. You know, I I don't have a BFA or MFA in acting. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up surrounded by that. And so I was was committed to to checking my ego at the door. Okay, I I really want to learn about this industry, and I really want to have some experiences, so let me just go do stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I... wrote a short film and directed it and acted in it. And that was an amazing experience. I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about it, but did it because I was curious and felt and continue to feel a strong burning need to write stories. And so I continue to write today. Do you? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've written four full length plays in the last, since graduating from college, each one less bad than the one before it. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited about the two ones I'm developing now. I think there's promise. There. Have you sent any to Anthony? Anthony. Oh, sorry, Anthony. I said Anthony Rapp. Um, Adam. Adam. Adam Rapp. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, no. We, we, no, no, no. No? All right. No, no. We, Adam and I have a, a wonderful relationship. I love him very much. I think he's brilliant. We're doing a job right now. You know, you save that for another day. He's, <laughs> he's written an extraordinary play. And frankly, um, doing this play takes most, if not all, of my creative time and energy and focus. And so I hesitate to put creative energies elsewhere while working on this play mm-hmm. because every night I step into a ring with Muhammad Ali. And if I don't give my full focus to Muhammad Ali, she will knock me out, frankly. 
does Mary Mary Louise Mary how does she Mary Louise Mary her Louise name. Um, does she give you shit if she can tell like you're elsewhere? Uh, like if I, your mind I, is. I wandering? try to never be elsewhere. <laughs> is, 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 is my answer. I try to never, ever, ever be elsewhere. And, and I think incredible. so far I've done an okay job of doing that. The writing is incredible. And to keep the play alive, both of us have to pull the tension really tight and keep it tight. And so there, there isn't really room for my mind to wander. You know, there's, there's not like a, you know, eight other people having a conversation over there and I can like breathe for a moment mm-hmm. and scratch my armpit or something. No, no, I step on stage and there's nowhere to hide. It's just the two of us. For the, the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Much like this, actually. Yeah. You, you and I have intimate microphones, and there's no one else here. I can't check out right now. I got to be on every word you're saying. Right. Right. Well, I won't give you shit if you need to, you know, scratch your armpit or something. So. Done. Armpit scratched. <laughs> armpit <laughs> At least we're scratched. not, we're and, not and also, I, I don't. Also, I'm not even sure if I agree with the framing of, like, you know, would she give me shit? We have the job to do of telling Adam's story, directed by David, who is just brilliant david my god mm-hmm. and so it, it it's more like how can we do our job at the best level possible and if at any moment we slip from that how can we keep each other up you know right yeah yeah just watching watching the two of you on stage and i mean i i've been a fan of hers for years um i think it would be it would be so surreal for me. I'm a little bit older than you are, so like I was heavy into weeds. Just loved that yeah. show, right? How, did you ever? Did you go back and watch it at all? Not since this, no, no. But no. I, I, many years ago, oh, you watched it originally. I watched yeah. It, yeah, I mean, just coming into a show and saying like this amazing Tony-winning actress, yeah. nominations out the wazoo for everything else. Like when you got the call, yeah, I got the part. A, did you know it was opposite her? And then B, do you remember that moment? Uh, I knew it was opposite her. Yes, yes, I did. I remember the moment very well. I was sitting in my apartment uh, alone. It was a sunny morning, maybe about 10 a.m., and the chemistry test was the day before. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 frankly, I felt perfect for the part. I felt like I understood roughly the world that Adam was creating. I I felt like I I could find my way into Christopher Dunn. I prepared the hell out of the scene. I prepared a page before it started. I prepared a page after it started. And and I did everything I could in the audition that I knew how to. And so if it didn't go my way, I knew I wouldn't walk out of there feeling dejected or feeling like I would regret anything because I I used all the tools that I knew how to use. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are tools that I don't have. I used the ones that I had. And so I walked out feeling like, okay, I feel like I'm right for this part. And I think that audition went pretty well. I hope I get it. And uh, I got an email the next morning from one of the casting associates. And she was like, hey, morning, uh, stay tuned. And that was all, you know, good, good, <laughs> good news coming your way was, was the email. So now I'm in my apartment just rocking back and <laughs> forth, you know, twitching out, pacing my apartment. I can't do anything. I can't read. I can't do anything. And it, and maybe 45 minutes later, my manager calls me. And normally I pick up and I'm like, hey, how are you? What's going on? I picked the phone up and I said, tell me, tell me. And, you know, and uh, yeah, I got the, got the offer. And that was for the Williamstown Theater Festival a year and a right. half ago. Right. Broadway was never guaranteed. A New York right. run was never guaranteed. This was for a two-week run in Williamstown. Right. But if, if, you know, if I go back to sort of the big picture thing, the thing that I want to do is tell compelling stories that ask hard questions, that make people laugh, work with incredible people. This project, I got to hit all of those things. And it's a two-week run in Williamstown? Fine. I get to, this is, this is why I became an actor, for this two-week run in Williamstown. Mm-hmm. That, that was extraordinary. And yeah. I didn't get into Williams College. So that was like, <laughs> oh, I get to go back on my own terms now. Happy days. <laughs> uh uh, how long after the Williamstown run did you know that it was going to come to Broadway? Uh, well, it, the play sort of had a, a, it got passed around between producers and there were rumors of a thing and maybe it would, but, but formally, formally, it was all set to go. You know, we, we have the offer, it's happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think in March of this year, April in this year, it, there was r- rumblings of things for quite some time, but March. So Adam Rapoff, obviously, uh, or he's a novelist, of course, who writes a lot of 
uh, he's written a lot of things in the past that are very small casts, like small char- small number of characters right. in a very intimate setting, more for the young adult audience. Um, and and did you were you familiar with his work before before this play, or did you did you start reading after you you got cast in this? Um, the first year after college, I. You know, if we go back to sort of your question from maybe 15 minutes ago, I was trying to just learn stuff and do stuff, right? Yeah. And so I wind up getting connected with MFA students up at Columbia, directors up at Columbia who are getting their master's in directing. Mm -hmm. And they need actors for their in-class directing exercises. So I went up and wind up connecting with a bunch of Columbia kids. And, you know, I learned how to act on camera on the job with Columbia kids. Students, directors, who, mm-hmm. who many of whom are still good friends of mine today. So anyway, one of the things we did, one of the first things, was a scene from Red Light Winter. And I read the play, and it rocked me. And that was a very important time in my life. I was becoming an artist for the first time. Mm-hmm. I was reading literature in a way that I was enjoying it, not just for an English class. I was getting to read poetry. I was watching a lot of movies. You know, I was becoming the person that I always imagined myself maybe I could be, mm-hmm. which was really exciting. So anyway, I did a scene from that show for the Columbia students, and it just resonated really deeply with me. That I, It just sort of rocked me to my core. And in the years that followed, that scene and that play have stayed with me, ethereally. I, I don't really know why. Like I, The play just couldn't go away. And so then when I found out about this one, I just sort of felt like, oh, of course. Of course it's Adam Rapp. <laughs> and it's his Broadway debut, right. too. That's, why, that's literally why I was bringing this question up. Oh, my up, is, God, man. Is, was, is it surprising, was it surprising that this is the first time any of his things have made it on, onto the Broadway stage? Well, I, from whose perspective? Surprising for who? For you. Like, well, with your expectations of his work and how good it is. Yeah, that seems surprising to me that it's Adam's first go-around on Broadway. Yeah. Um, he also writes really, you know, intense stuff that isn't necessarily the most, um, you know, Broadway producible stuff. He, he's writing amazing, hard question asking off Broadway work, um, but he's an incredible writer, and I'm, you know, I'm so happy for him. It's great. It's yeah. wonderful. I'm so happy. God, he deserves it so much. It's wonderful. Well, the, everyone needs to see this. Uh, just simply because, I mean, if, if you want like drama you want something that's going to go home and make you think yeah right the thing that i think is brilliant about adam is he is unafraid to stare at things baldly and unflinchingly and then to examine those things with intellect and wit and humor and so anyone who's doing that i think gosh that's what we need right Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i i I look at musicals right now and i i there's nothing I, i don't have anything truly against the musicals that are on Broadway right now. Um, but I, I'm i craving another musical right now with a completely original concept. Hmm. Because there's like Moulin Rouge is based on something and Tina is based on something and Jagged Little Pill is based on something and everything is based on something popular from a decade or more ago. Right. And I love that the sound inside is just this this concept and this story that is just straight out of somebody's imagination. Yeah. The thanks. deepest part of their imagination brought most likely, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can't speak to any of the musical theater stuff, but uh, yeah, Adam said something once that resonated with me. He said that writing a novel for him is like jazz and writing a play is like architecture. Huh. And so it strikes me that this play is probably some combination of them both, of tapping into the subconscious and the unconscious and just free-flowing jazz. And then once it's all out there, oh, yeah, how do we, but how do we make a building out of all of this and piecing it together? Hmm. Well, and so I think David Cromer probably has a lot to do with that. Oh, boy. I mean, he won the Tony for Band's Visit last year. He did. Uh, just an incredible, in, incredible director. What did, what did he bring? I guess what was the process of working with him like? What did he bring to your performance that you didn't know was there. I think David is so good at just pulling out honesty. Really? Yeah, we'd be in the rehearsal room and and we're trying to figure out a moment. He'd be like, guys, 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 just what would a person do? Just do it like a person would do it. And, <laughs> and, and to have, I think for, for a director to have that level of confidence, 
you know, to have so much experience directing that you can distill it all the way down to just what would a person do mm-hmm. is it's really all you need, right? And and I think is is probably a testament to his faith in Adam's writing and his faith in us as actors to bring it to life. Um, we're not putting any hats on hats, right? We're not like showing you a moment and then doing the moment. Yeah. It's just what just behave like people, which he he gave us the space to do. Did was was Adam in the room for a lot of the rehearsal? Oh yeah, for for a lot of it. He really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, we we moved a lot of things around early on in the process, a lot of pages around and moments. So that was a collaborative effort. Um, a between Adam very generously being open to his work being shaped like that in mm-hmm. a play. B, David facilitating all of that and, you know, getting his fingers in the weeds. And C, Mary Louise might be a dramaturgical genius. Just from a, ignore the acting. Just from the writing and thinking perspective, she mm-hmm. would say, okay, but if we do this, what if we move this bit to over there and then we sort of tweak it like this? And we'd all, we would all sit there and go, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. That's pretty reasonable. And and I you know I really tip the hat to Adam for um, you know being open to that and yeah. we collaborating all together. I I don't know if all of her ideas were home runs, but many of them I think probably were. That's really cool when you can have, I mean, not only a director and a playwright who are so open to taking that feedback from the actors who did literally move entire scenes around or entire pages or whatever the, whatever the question is, you know, if you're moving moments, right. you know, that changes the rhythm of a show. Sure. Sure. And, and Adam is, you know, Adam is a, a brilliant composer, right? He writes music. He, mm-hmm. write, he writes these plays that have an internal music to them and an internal flow, um, which I can really feel, I mean, God, in, in the moments that are, are really good, you, you can just feel like you're playing a piece of music, which is, mm-hmm. which is how it feels often. Yeah, yeah. The the sound, the sound inside. I've said this to him too. The sound inside sort of feels like a symphony. You know, he's he's written this beautiful piece of music that if we just get up, okay, now I got to play the violin. She's got to play the cello. Now I got to play the oboe. She's got to play the guitar. That if we just do it all together, it becomes hopefully, if we do our jobs right, very beautiful and very moving. Well, some people have agreed with you. I mean, you mentioned in in a Time article. From December first, uh, the the article was the ten best theater performances of 2019, and you were in there. Gosh, yeah, that's something else. Thanks, time. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what more to say. Thank you so much. We're we're doing our best, and um, it's extraordinary to know that people are moved by this and people are responding. Did you know that was coming, or did like yeah. do you know when reviewers like Times? I mean, no. th- they're not a reviewer, but. Um, you didn't know when they were in the audience, or you, you no, know, like, no. did you see the article after it came out, or did you get a heads up from the publicist or anything for the Time article? Yeah, no, I think I saw it on Instagram or something. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's ridiculous. You'd have a Google alert set up for yourself? No, no, no. that's what moms are for. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, this person over there on this bar- bulletin board is talking shit about your performance. <laughs> I don't like. I don't. My, like, actually, my dad does a lot of that. My dad is peruses. Combing through the internet, said, well, some, one person said this one thing about this one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, Dad, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, he's fine. Dad, you know, nine hundred people came tonight, right? I, I got to do it every night. Or yeah, something, you know? yeah eight, one out of nine hundred, or you know, you know, not probably not going to be their favorite play. Well, um, I hope so. I hope all nine hundred love it. Well, that's the idea. Yeah, that's the hope. But um, where do you see yourself going in the future? Because you do have such an eclectic background in the production side, and now you're talking about writing. Yeah. And um, you do play music, and so it sounds like, you know, you sing. Um, I like to. <laughs> <laughs> like I what, really enjoy singing. What do you, where do you want to go with this? Like now that, you know, you get on Broadway, and for a lot of people, it's, you know, it's it's the ceiling that once you break through, it opens a lot of doors. Um, where do you Where do you hope to move into next? I, I don't, it's not the what's next question because yeah. that's annoying and I don't ever want to ask it. But career wise, right? What like genre, what area do you think you want to focus on? Well, I, I go back to the big picture thing. You know, what's next? I want to be smart and ask hard questions and make people laugh and unite people. One of the things that I think is beautiful about theater is that for better or worse, you're in a room together with 200 or 500 or 1,000 people. And in a time where things feel divisive and things feel 
angry and people are on their phones a lot, just to sit in a room with people is really special, right? Mm -hmm. And if the play is good, more times than not, you walk out, frankly, feeling more connected to your fellow human. So that feels like a really beautiful thing to be a part of, right? Hopefully, whatever comes next continues to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to do a, I'd love to be in, act in a beautiful film. Um, I'm going to continue to write the pieces that I'm working on. I'd love to direct a play. I'd love to direct a film um, that I really enjoy throwing paint on the wall and, and seeing what sticks. So we'll see. We'll see what sticks. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a sign, a good sign. You can, you're able to have multiple plates spinning. And eventually, one of those is going to succeed. And, you know, whatever you put in air quotes as a success. Right. And then I think it helps everything else along. Yeah. Oh, man. It's been so valuable to try the other disciplines. It's been so valuable. ADing was a really valuable experience. Yeah. Oh, man, was that a valuable experience. Because I got to see actors being directed from the outside. I got to see directors directing. And I got to be in this role that required a lot of organizational focus and timing and not that much creativity. The first thing that I ever did uh, when I graduated, the first paid thing I did was a day of background acting on Royal Pains. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to know what it was like. I wanted, yeah. I, I wanted to, you know, okay, what's it like to be a background actor? Got it. Okay, now I understand. Yep, yep. And I'd never, I'd never been on a set before. Ever. Oh, really? What's it like to be on a set? I don't know. Let's go find out. Yeah. So, so we'll see. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have experiences in the world and learn new things and challenge myself and grow. Well, oh, speaking of which, I, I was reading too that um, you mentioned that you've pretty much read all the literature that's mentioned in the show, in your show. I've read a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've had this unbelievable literature education courtesy of Adam Rapp. It's great, man. <laughs> Spent the last year and a half reading all these books with the hope. I mean, I started right when I got, when I was offered the play back in, I want to say April of 2018. So it's been a year and a half of reading Dostoevsky and James Salter and um, Sylvia Plath, J.D. Salinger. Do you have a favorite? I think probably of the books mentioned in the play, Franny and Zoe and, uh, and Light Years by James Salter probably moved me the most, the two of them. Hmm. And, and that was, you know, I had never read um, Catcher in the Rye. I'd never read it. Really? Yeah. So, so I read Franny and Zoe and that cracked my world wide open. So I read all of J.D. Salinger. I read all his stuff. Oh man, can he write. You seem like an old soul. Do, you, do people tell you that? Uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I, I've been told that. Um, yeah, like you're not even you're like 27. Still, yeah. you know, we'll call that mid 20s still. But but you have this. Someone called me a middle aged man yesterday. <laughs> I know. Knowing you were 27. Yeah. I looked at her. I said, I, I'm not middle aged. No. At all. I hope not. Right. Gosh, I hope that wasn't like a portentous omen or something jeez yeah was it like a 12 year old that told me no, that? no 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 yeah the the well i was saying like your your quest for knowledge and your desire to learn and expand your mind is something that i mean even among myself and my peers like didn't come in until well into our 30s yeah because you you want to get out the the crazy like in your twenties you want to go out and you know, let's get drunk and let's oh it's a Thursday oh it's a Friday oh it's a Saturday like let's just go out every single night in New York because you can mm. and maybe this is actually just occurred to me maybe this is because you're from New York that it causes kids to grow up faster I think there may be an aspect of truth in that um, I I feel like I I lived a lot of lives growing up. You know, I, I went, I grew up in Carroll Gardens and then I went to middle school in Coney Island. And so I got on the, the yellow school bus and drove out to Coney Island every day and then went to high school in Bay Ridge. And I, I just lived all these different lives. You know, I, I, if I walked to the corner to go get pizza on mm -hmm. my way there, I'd hear people with accents from all around the world speaking all kinds of different languages. Mm -hmm. And this is before iPhones or cell phones. And so it just requires a certain level of like awareness in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, okay. I don't even know if that guy speaks English. I got to like pay attention here, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, maybe maybe that's what it is. I, I I dated a girl many years ago. I dated a girl who who grew up in Brooklyn, and it was and she's like, oh yeah, I did like all these hardcore drugs, and I got drunk all the time, and then I went to college, and I was like, Wait, <laughs> what? Because <laughs> <laughs> gosh, where I was from, you did all that stuff after college or maybe in college. Yeah, so I, here it's a little bit accelerated. Yeah, you know, I. I, I Yes, yes, I think that's true. And by the time I came into acting so late that by the time I dove in, I didn't want to go out and party. I didn't want to like go out to the bars on yeah. the weekends. I wanted to read books and watch movies. And every minute that I had felt like a minute to learn or to expand or to become a more fully formed artist. I I, I had a fake ID in high school. I went to the bars. You know what I mean? That right. it, it was time for a new yeah, chapter. There you go. Right. So you already did that before you even... Before most people ever did, you were doing it. So, well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So we'll wrap up here. And there are three standard closing questions oh, that I ask everybody to end the episode. The first one is, what motivates you? What motivates me? I, adding light and joy into the world making the people around me whom I love proud of me and and making life more full and making the world a more livable place. All right. Okay. <laughs> was, there's no, there's no my, wrong answer. Yeah. Everybody's answer is also so blueberry pie. <laughs> <laughs> if you got paid in blueberry pie that'd and could okay. therefore pay your bills. That'd be okay. In blueberry pie. That'd be okay. All right. Yeah. What advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now, starting out down a similar path? Oh, man. How young? You pick. Starting out on a similar path. I think one of the things that was most valuable to me was spending time alone and just being alone and dealing with that and not escaping through the internet. What is it like to just sit in a room and be alone? What thoughts come up? Um, I think that allowed me to learn a lot about myself. So sp spend time alone. You know, on that note too, I try, I try to detach from technology in small doses as much as I can. Yeah. But in small doses, and one of the things I'm very conscious about is when I get into elevators, I, I want to not pull out my phone. Oh, interesting. Because everyone else is on their phone. Everyone else yeah. is on their phone. And like, I've been in the elevators walking around with like some well-known people and some celebrities. And I'm like, if you just look up, I'm, I'm literally bringing Bob Saget to the next floor, and you're just completely <laughs> engulfed in Facebook. Like, no, they're on Insta, they're on Twitter, tweeting that they're standing next to Bob Saget. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there. Yeah. I, anyway, that's that's my whole thing. I'm just like, there are small moments yeah. of connection. Yeah. And for and for uh, people now that are growing up, the the art of conversation and the art of looking somebody in the eye, I think is is going away. Well, I hope S not. Says the old man. I hope not. Yeah. Do you, Get off do, my lawn. Do you find that in your experience? I do. I do. And that's part of why I really, really enjoy doing this podcast oh, is yeah. because I can sit down uninterrupted for an hour and look at somebody in the eye, whether I know them or not. You have to be vulnerable. I have to be vulnerable. If we're, if we're going to make anything here that people are going to want to listen to, yeah. it needs to be real. I, my phone's on airplane mode yeah. uh, across the table. And it needs to, yes, it needs to be authentic. And, and I just feel like there are so many opportunities to connect with people. And like you said, make the world a little bit happier and a better place that we just totally ignore. Because, and I'm, I'm completely going on a tangent here. <laughs> um, chemically, we are falling in love with our phones. Oh, that's because um, oxytocin is released in our brains when it's it's you know the love the love chemical in your brain, and when you get a like, when you get positive mm -hmm. comments, when you're seeing on your social media just all you know, especially people um, who are who are po very popular have a lot of followers, subscribers. They just see this coming and they're going and they have to post. They have to post. Right. Chemically, they're becoming addicted. They're in love with their phones, with their likes, with that validation. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really fascinating to me, but yet at the same time makes me really sad. I love the show Big Mouth. This yeah. is Nick Kroll reference number two on this podcast. <laughs> Shout out Nick Kroll. I love the show Big Mouth. And on the new season, there's a, a plot line where Nick Kroll's character basically falls in love with his phone. And, yeah. she, and she becomes 
the phone is anthropomorphized, which sounds crazy, right? Because it's a machine. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so final question. All right. If you can only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want. Theater show? Any show. Any show. One show, and I can see it as many times as I want for the rest of my life. Oh, my God. Uh, well, the thing that I'm thinking about is what is something that has many layers that I can keep mining new truths from, that I can learn a lot from, that will keep my engagement, that brings me joy. The, like they said, I'm, I'm sort of filtering through all these files of yeah. <clears throat> what's one thing that maybe brings me all of those things. Uh, can I have more wall? Give me more, more walls. Give me either movie or, or a theater. Or, uh, theater that happened in the last decade. Okay, that's very good. Uh, I don't know. I, I love Hamilton so much. That is not a bad answer. I love the music so much. And on that same note, Freestyle Love Supreme is another good one. I really want to go see it. Yeah, oh, I was thinking so maybe I'll go this Sunday night. Anyway, I really want to go. I Please know they have do. Sunday night shows. Yeah. Please do. Yeah, yeah. And it's different every time. Cool. And it cool. inspires. I, I talked with um, Shockwave, Chris Sullivan, and Anissa Folds, uh, young niece, and um, they they were both like, they, they blew out my idea of what freestyle was supposed to be, mm -hmm. which is, you know, in a lot of people's minds, it's like putting somebody down, you're battling the rap battle, right? But they're like, no, before every show, I got your back. I got your back. I'm here for you. I got your back. Love so that. if they know that if anybody starts to have struggle, something like somebody else jumps in and takes over and they are such a, like a loving, inspiring group. And they don't talk negatively about anything. Even when they're making stuff up on stage, it's all just positive positivity. I love that so much. Yeah. So you, I, have you seen really that movie? Enjoy. Don't think twice. The Mike Birbiglia movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think Mike Birbiglia is a genius. His, his new show, the new one just came out on Netflix. I saw it last year. I don't, I don't know Mike at all. I, I, I'm just a genuine fan. Um, and in the movie, Don't Think Twice, which is about um, improv comedians, one of the opening scenes is the five of them walking in sort of this chaotic circle, tapping each other. I got your back. I yeah. got your back. I got your back. I got your back. And that image has stayed with me all these years. That's what they. That's literally what they do before that's every so show. That's so beautiful. Yeah. That's such a, a beautiful thing to do yeah. in this world, in this day and age. All right. So we can find you online on Twitter and Instagram at Will Hockman. With, that's... Uh, do that again. We can find you online on Twitter and Instagram at Will Hockman. That's H O C H M A N. And of course, soundinsidebroadway.com playing until January 12th. Everybody get your tickets. Gosh, it is so good. Anything else? Anywhere else we can find you? Are you on Facebook? I'm not on. I deleted my Facebook years good ago. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. But I'm on Instagram. I use Twitter sparingly. Yeah. You can find me in the world. I'm out on the streets walking around. That's right. Eighth <laughs> Avenue and 53rd at exactly 4.30 every Thursday. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you can get more of me at the theaterpodcast.com. Support this podcast, please, at theaterpodcast.com slash Patreon. Find me on Instagram and Twitter, theater underscore podcast. Please leave a rating, leave a review. This is edited by Matthew Hendershot. Thank you to Jukebox the Ghost for the intro and outro music. And Will Hockman, thank you most of all. This has been very, very fun. Thank you so much. I got your back. I got your back. I got your back. Take a deep breath, make the world a little colorful.